Good morning and welcome to this session on the growing array of career choices in cybersecurity. What qualifications do you need? My name is Eric Lopez and I'm the security architect at Seton Hall University. I also have the privilege of teaching our annual cybersecurity boot camp and mentoring students who are interested in pursuing a career in the information security field. This morning, I'm pleased to introduce the speakers for this first session. First, we'll hear from Jeremy Livingston. He's the Associate Vice President for Security Solutions Development and the Chief Information Officer for Edge's Edge Secure. He'll be speaking on teaching cybersecurity as a practical discipline. Following that presentation, we'll hear from Father Joseph Laracy. He's a priest of the Archdiocese of Newark and member of the Seton Hall University priest community whose principal technical interests are in system science, specifically in systems theory, applied dynamical systems and systems engineering. And he'll be joined by Thomas Marlowe, a professor emeritus of mathematics and computer science at Seton Hall University. And they'll be speaking on a novel approach to cybersecurity based on systems theory. Then we're gonna wrap up this morning's session with a great discussion led by Professor David Weiss. He's the founder and director of the Institute for Dispute Resolution at New Jersey City University. And he'll lead a discussion, so please feel free during the presentations, answer, ask any questions in the Q&A box to the right of your uh, team screen, and we'll cover those questions during the panel. Yes, our, we're done with introductions. It's all you, Jeremy. Go ahead. All right. Yep. Thank you. To go. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you. As as mentioned, I'm Jeremy Livingston. Um, uh, uh, let me do a, a brief bio slide. Um, I've been a chief information security officer for about seven years. Um, I started off in the in the Navy and then the federal government. After that, went through several different positions. Um, currently, I'm working with New Jersey Edge. We're a nonprofit founded by the University uh, President's Council here in New Jersey. Um, I work for a handful of universities as a virtual CISO, and, um, and I also teach classes for American Public University, so I teach um, cybersecurity policy and procedure, as well as digital forensics. All right. So I wanted to get into, you know, what is cybersecurity? Um, you know, Webster's Dictionary says it's, it's any measures taken to protect your computer or computer system against unauthorized access or attack. But really, when we're talking about jobs and cybersecurity and career paths and what we're learning, it's so much more than that. Um, I know a lot of people think that um, cybersecurity jobs are focused around, you know, uh, you know, black hat and red hat, blue hat, uh, you know, the the hackers, the the very technical people sitting there. And, and when you watch movies and TV, it's always streams of code flying down from the sky and all this stuff. Um, really, it's a lot more varied than just that, though. You don't have to be extremely technical sometimes. There are tons of career paths, and I'll go through um, a couple of different ones here. So, Cybersecurity can be broken up into all of these different areas. There's information assurance, doing um, doing jobs like working on compliance, regu regulatory, audit, um, you know, things like that. Uh, information system security officer, information system security manager, um, you know, managing the documentation, the policy, the procedure, all of the back end pieces that go through. Um, you know, security. There's also the, the more technical side, you know, working in cyber or a security operations center. That's the, the red hat, blue hat, blue team. Um, you know, pen testers fall into this category, security operations center. Um, I, read, I, I led the security operations center at the Food and Drug Administration for a few years. You know, to run something like that, you've got 20 people, it's staffed 24 7. Um, there's tier one, tier two, tier three, very technical, but at the same time, we had six other teams supporting the SOC. So you've got every everybody from compliance, documentation, policy, 
um, legal teams. We had physical security teams, insider threat teams, um, secure travel teams, all of these other areas supporting that that mission. Um, and then down at the bottom, I list other. You know, some of those other ones, insider threat team. You know, what is that? From a cybersecurity standpoint, it could just be looking at your own company, your own employer. Um, in that case, it was a federal government agency. You're looking at the employees and tr trying to determine, you know, are there insider threats? Are they exfiltrating your data and and selling it out in the black market or to a foreign government or an adversary, things like that. Um, a travel team. So in organizations where you have, you know, employees or you know agents that are traveling to foreign countries, oftentimes it makes sense to, to give them uh, a secure device to take with them. They don't want to take their standard laptop that might be loaded with trade secrets. Um, there are a lot of legal ways where countries or adversaries overseas can get access to the data that's on those laptops. I mean, he, even here in the US, when you travel through Customs and Border Protection, they are legally allowed to require you to unlock and open your device and they can scan it and take whatever information they want out of there. No warrant needed, no, no, no probable cause, nothing like that. <clears throat> so a travel team prepares people for travel especially to areas where they're you know, prone to um, either physical or known cyber attacks, things like that. Um, other career paths in, in cyber, uh, sales. You'd, you'd be surprised. A lot of people that I know have ended up in, in really good sales roles working with some of the, the companies out there that are doing you know, advanced endpoint protection, selling SOC solutions, SIEM tools, there's so many different ways out there that people can work in that. Um, another area that I kind of left off of this chart as well would be engineering. Um, and we'll get to that on the next slide, but uh, you know, engineering could be helping build those security tools, you know, building the tools that the other, the other areas of cybersecurity use to function in their jobs. Um, and then the last part I put there is legal. I have actually known a lot of lawyers and, and other legal professionals who are now going back to school learning about cyber because we need lawyers that are focused on cyber threats. Um, there are a lot of legal aspects to working in cyber. I've, I've always worked very closely with legal counsel and a lot of times we've had to bring in specialized legal counsel that focuses on cyber issues. Um, whether it's everything from re recently in the news, we're talking about is it legal to pay a ransom if the if the person who has attacked you and, and you know is ransoming your data back to you, you know if they're on some sort of a a, 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 a blocked list or you know a sanctioned individual or company or country, you know how do you make payments to get your data back? Um, should you make payments? There's a lot of legal questions and decisions that go into that. So that's just one aspect where legal really comes into play. Um, I wanted to talk on the next slide here. This is a security certification progression chart. So we often talk about cyber education in, in higher education. You know, we're talking about getting your, your bachelor's, your master's degree. Um, some people go on and get a doctorate. But there's a lot there's a lot more to it than that. I know as as a former hiring manager and and well, I still am in some extent, but you know, I've hired a ton of people, and what we're looking for is a well-rounded individual. Um, and depending on which area you are, you might need different certifications to meet those qualifications. Um, everything from at the very bottom, security plus goes across almost the entire area. If you're working in in IT security, uh, it's almost a given that you should have at least security plus. It shows a basic level of understanding, personal computing security. Um, they go up from there, but as you can see, there are different verticals. There's security management, security architecture, security analysis, defensive operations, you know, um, offensive operations, and then security engineering. So when you're looking to, to fill a role or, or whatever, you want to make sure that you're focusing your efforts, your education, your certifications on which route you want to take in cybersecurity. Um, 
Next slide. So, you know, how do we teach cybersecurity? This is a tough one because, you know, it's there's a lot of aspects to it. I, I do a lot of um, there's lectures, you know, just sitting here talking about it. Um, labs, hand on experiments. We do a lot of that with a digital forensics course where you actually work in the labs and, and practice the, the things that you're learning in theory. Writing and research is important, especially if you're going to be doing policy, legal, compliance, those type of areas. Um, and then policy discussion. So even if you're going to be on the very technical end of things, you need to have at least a basic understanding of why are policies important, what are the legal requirements, those type of things. Um, as far as students though, I would recommend that they download tools and practice themselves. If you don't get enough hands-on experience in your class, um, download Kali Linux, play around with that. Uh, you can get VirtualBox, um, you know, free tools like that. You can always go uh, read different policies, procedures. There's uh, every, all the NIST documentation is free online available. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about before I turn this over is in cybersecurity, you know, what do we do? We protect people from themselves most of the time. Um, it's not it's not us fighting hackers. Usually it's us fighting our own users because they click on things they shouldn't, they download stuff they shouldn't have. Almost 90% of all of the attacks come from the people that work with us on these systems. So we take a, you know, a wide array of, of methods to fix that. Administrative controls, you know, simply setting rules and saying you're not allowed to do these things. Uh, technical, technical controls, we block them from downloading bad stuff. We, we run antivirus, those type of things. <clears throat> and then the last one, um, educating the users. I probably spend the majority of my time these days focused on educating users. Um, we run internal phishing tests against them. You know, if they fail the phishing test, we give remedial training. Um, and then just having conversations, explaining to them why this is important, what damage could be done to the institution, but also to themselves, their own personal accounts, if they don't take better care. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, if you have any questions, there's a QA and a at the end. I'd be happy to help you out and answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, Jeremy. I'll share our slides. Right, I'd like to begin by uh, presenting our approach. We have, as I've said before, rather too many slides, so I'm going to ask you to read some of the content next. So overview is how can we present those studying cybersecurity with a full and integrated view? We're going to look at the current state, We're going to look at the security as a socio-technological problem, look at an organizing principle, and then some class recommendations, course structure program recommendations next. And where do we stand? Next. So global internet is obviously in a state of crisis. We're looking mostly at the technical aspects. But on the other hand, we have lots of personal issues that we'll talk about it, talk about. So we have lots of attacks on the one hand. Next. Additional threats, threats to confidentiality, all the integrity, availability, non repudiation, authorization, authentication, auditability, and these are things that, as the last talk just mentioned, are present often even for the most advanced users, and people do bite and can be infiltrated by very strange approaches. Products have been developed as point solutions, but a comprehensive solution is lacking. In addition, as we've just heard both in the keynote and in the earlier pre Jeremy's presentation, lots of issues with deeper than particular applications. 
embedded in the internet architecture of the internet and also issues as we'll see on the next slide i'm going actually faster uh, we have devsecops which has been mentioned again both times combining agility devops approach to continuous and integrated development operations combined with automated and early and continuous focus on security with an enterprise view and largely orthogonal to the issues presented here, although it needs to be addressed in education. Okay, go. So the pro one problem is in academic programs in security, there are several places for security oriented courses, but most departments tend to focus on their own areas of interest. So mathematics departments on algorithms and protocols, computer science programs on programming, preventive software engineering, program analysis, software implementation, and security tools. Data science, both on the one hand, is a challenge because of the possibility of getting into some of its applications, but also provides for analyses and other tools for the security world so we have to deal with that and data science applications mostly when they talk about security data science programs mostly deal with those two possibilities the issue of threats arriving the use of the cloud or from large programs and on the other hand where data science can help in security business and it introduce students to risk issues economic analysis business processes practices for maintaining security computer engineering will focus on the infrastructure including physical aspects including interaction with what i think was called first order threats risks so flood fire outages and so on or for that matter the covid problem and then we have to deal with the people aspects attacks through human vulnerabilities and those may not be addressed in any of these programs at all but through programs in psychology or something else as was mentioned in the keynote we're not so much talking about uh, the CISO aspects that were covered wonderfully in the keynote we're not talking about talking about the business language but in terms of people realizing the full scope of the security problem so we need to deal with the full spectrum of threats preventative techniques approaches for mitigation of consequences so again risk analysis is a big deal and it has to be comprehensive father could go back to the last slide for a second Sorry. and we can't cover everything and we need to prioritize according to threats from the internet we do need a systemic view we are again dealing mostly with the broad based technical and risk oriented aspects. This would need, be, need to be complemented with the, in the personal aspects that were dealt with, as I said so nicely in the past two presentations. Next. So let's look. We have key terms security, vulnerability, and threat. Next. And we propose to try to look at a complex view through a complex socio technical system. And we need a holistic model that addresses technological architecture, organizational behavior, human factors, to which we can, of course, add some of the concerns that came up in the previous. So this suggests a novel method for information security education. And I'll let Father take over from here. Thank you. So, our proposal uh, essentially has uh, three aspects. The first is to identify and characterize deficiencies in an, an existing network security control structure, uh, then to elucidate the relationship between software engin engineering, system engineering, and security risks. And then finally, all of this should inform an architectural description 
for a new secure architecture. We believe that the uh, problem of information security is very amenable to a systems approach. The security expert Peter Neumann points out that it's holistic approaches that consider systems in their entirety rather than just focusing on specific properties or specific components. And so we, we note here the, uh, the existence of emergent properties. Peter Checkland uh, points out that uh, in, in many complex systems, or even systems we don't think are complex, but we, we do note that there are um, emergent properties. We can talk about, for example, the, the, uh, the chemical analysis of ammonia, but the uh, phenomena of the smell of ammonia would, would be something classified as an emergent property. You don't just understand that from looking at uh, the description in a chemistry textbook. Um, and emergent properties are, are very um, much a factor when there's humans in the loop uh, interacting with uh, the technical aspects. So in our approach, we hope that students come to appreciate that security is an emergent system property. Uh, we, we can't really talk anymore about in a meaningful way security of an individual device in isolation. Uh, it's only in the broader socio-technical system uh, perspective that we can achieve our goal or goals. For example, you might say that an individual computer is secure if it's isolated in a, in a very absolute way, but once that is connected to a wireless network, a whole new classes of, of uh, individual uh, of uh, vulnerabilities emerge. And even if we bolt our computer down, we have a boot up password, we encrypt the file system, we would never say that this device is absolutely secure. And one reason for this is that security really is a system property. Now, Peter Neumann points out, I think quite wisely, that there are uh, three ways in which vulnerabilities usually arise. Uh, a technological gap between what a system is capable of enforcing and what it is expected to enforce, uh, a socio-technical gap between the system policies and social policies and uh, what is actually going on, and then the social gap between human behavior and social policies. So to achieve uh, our vision, we are um, presenting a, an approach um, originally developed at MIT called System Theoretic Accident Models and Processes. This was developed by Dr. Nancy Levison in the Complex Systems Research Lab, particularly for the problem of safety engineering and looking at how um, constraints can be instantiated to avoid, eliminate hazards and thereby prevent accidents. Our work has been to extend this paradigm from safety into security and to address issues of confidentiality, availability, integrity, et cetera, these uh, specific uh, issues within the context of security engineering. So in the systems theoretic accident models and process view, there are two types of complexity, both behavioral and structural. And in contrast to you know, the traditional scientific method that you learn in, in elementary school uh, based on analytic reduction, systems theory tells us that we must consider the systems that we are studying in a more holistic way. And uh, our approach builds on uh, the insights of the early figures in this field, in, uh, particularly in first order cybernetics, general systems theory, and within this space, we recognize a new type of comp complexity, which we uh, call structural complexity. Now, we're all familiar with systems that exhibit organized simplicity. These are the traditional deterministic systems. When you do decomposition to subsystems and components, you can get a very good understanding of the overall system. 
Resynthesis does not present any uh, unexpected properties. Conversely, it's not straightforward or useful to decompose systems for an analysis when they exhibit unorganized complexity. These are systems where we have to apply statistical techniques like the law of large numbers. Think about uh, if you've studied uh, chemistry, the uh, law of ideal gases. But there's another type of complexity, dynamic complexity. And this is what we need to consider uh, as system scientists when there is a uh, more complex nonlinear relationship. You might also think of combinator combinatorial complexity, um, computational complexity, the needle in a haystack problem, the traveling salesperson problem. But dynamic complexity is really different from either of these. John Sturman at MIT, uh, the director of the System Dynamics uh, Research Group in the Sloan School, points out that dynamic complexity arises in systems that are tightly coupled, governed by feedback, nonlinear, path dependent, et cetera. And these, these uh, certainly are aspects uh, present in the socio-technical systems that um, for which we are concerned about cybersecurity. In such systems, we see a lot of dynamic complexity, strong nonlinear interactions and coupling, and we need to view them from multiple integrated perspectives and take a, a real, more of a top-down rather than a bottom-up approach for analysis. Again, going to, to uh, Checkland, he emphasizes the concepts of emergence and hierarchy in such systems, as well as the role of communication and control, and that those principles guide our process. In StampSec, we, we, we look at systems in layers, acknowledging that as we move from layer N to layer N plus one, or from N to N minus one, that we have to factor in emergence, emergent properties, and also consider the communication and the, therefore the control between the layers. Control actions, for example, um, can enforce constraints to, present, to prevent uh, security vulnerabilities from emerging or from uh, being created. Feedback loops in such systems create dynamic equilibrium. And as Levison points out, we, when we're considering safety and security, we, we cannot simply look at the static design. We have to acknowledge the dynamic processes uh, looking at the technical system, but also its surrounding environment. So in order to maybe un better understand security incidents, we specify the following concepts. Part one, what is the problem environment? And this includes the constraints that we, we develop, which are our security requirements, the controls to instantiate them, the context. And the context, of course, includes the roles and responsibilities of the people, the environment, and the, the behavior shaping factors. The second part is identifying problems and structuring the solution considering flaws in the control process, dysfunctional interactions, erroneous actions, reasons for flawed control actions and dysfunctional interactions. And here we see errors in the algorithm, incorrect processes, inadequate coordination, reference channel flaws, feedback flaws. Again, these security constraints are our requirements that we write to prevent the instantiation of particular threats and the control actions implement the constraints. So we have to be attentive to flaws in the control process that would lead to inadequate control. Inadequate control is what allows the threats to take place. And these um, flaws in control are caused by dysfunctional interactions, failures, flawed decisions, and erroneous controlled actions. So the reasons for these flaws and dysfunction must be identified. 
Now we know that in general, inspired by control theory, we can have four types of inadequate control. A required action is not provided, an incorrect or unsafe action is provided, a potentially correct or adequate action is provided, but at the wrong time, and finally, a correct control action is stopped too soon. And there are many ways that inadequate control can lead to a system being compromised. We know three categories, inadequate enforcement of constraints, inadequate execution of control actions, or inappropriate or missing feedback. Now, the introduction of a malicious actor doesn't violate the assumption of this taxonomy that we're building off of, which was originally uh, developed for safety engineering. In the safety scenario, poor engineering or management may offer inadequate enforcement of constraints, inadequate execution of control, feedback such that a hazard is, expo is exploited. In the security realm, again, poor engineering or management can lead to the inadequate enforcement of constraints, execution of control, or feedback such that a vulnerability is created. So whether the bottom line is whether we're considered we're concerned with safety or security, the problem is inadequate control. And the stamp sec uh, model extends the safety list to capture security issues, which we'll just list very quickly. So students studying cybersecurity must take note of many of these inadequacies are not simply the result of classical event-based risk. We have to factor in communication and control, time lags and flaws in the design process. And we begin our, our, our um, modeling looking at the, the seven high level system threats that we identified as our goal at the beginning of our presentation. And we note that these threats can be unintentional. They can be due to a catastrophe like Dr. Marlow mentioned, such as a fire. They can be due to the interaction of subsystems. And threats related to social engineering are a huge part of, of um, the cybersecurity problem. Things like fear, greed, desire, indolence, carelessness, ideology can lead to security risks. Another aspect of the stamp sec approach is modeling of control structures. Here you see a high level control structure uh, developed for the next generation air transportation system a project uh, carried out by the FAA and the, and the JPDO, the Joint Project Development Office, uh, looking at some of the key communication and control uh, between an aircraft, um, air traffic control, uh, GPS, et cetera. At the end of the StampSec process, we want to carry out what is called system dynamics modeling System Dynamics was a methodology developed by Jay Forrester at MIT, uh, a computer engineer that got involved in uh, management science. And with System Dynamics, we can understand how the static control structure, like you just saw on the previous slide, can evolve over time, particularly in the event of an attack by a malicious actor. System Dynamics allows us to model not only uh, the dynamics endogenously, but also factoring in extra, ex exogenous factors. The basis for system dynamics is control theory and nonlinear dynamical systems. And applied in the stamp set context, we can incorporate tech technical, organizational, and social um, aspects of our cybersecurity system. Martinez Moyano points out that the system dynamics approach really allows us to bring together the social, managerial, economic, ecological, and technical aspects of a socio-technical system.
if you've uh, studied uh, differential equations, uh, you, you, you have the, the basic building blocks for system dynamics. System dynamics models uh, are numeric models that are easy to build with a graphical user interface that um, address the dynamicity of these socio-technical systems with continuous differential, uh, ordinary differential equations. And Nicholas uh, Dulac and Brandon Owens uh, developed a approach for a multi-level uh, abstractive model for system dynamics, beginning at level one with the, the major loops, then going into the, the, the model modules, um, specifying the variables in the minor loops, uh, making clear your assumptions and conventions, and then finally entering the data and the equations. Here you see a very high level uh, system dynamics diagram uh, trying to capture the dynamics um, with the problem of terrorism. So you can see the reinforcing and balancing loops, uh, the, the, the key variables that have been identified, uh, the time delays, and how, uh, again, just look, you look at a problem of terror, the, uh, the, the, the number of feedbacks is, is significant, and this is just at the very highest level. So now I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to conclude again to Dr. Marlow. So we've looked at the five steps. And again, I will acknowledge that we probably need to deal more with the user aspects. But this is if you want a, an approach to people who want to understand some of the technical aspects and how they fit in in a general program of education for cybersecurity. Next. So next. OK, so at the technical end and even into the in the human end, SciSec can serve as an organizational principle. It provides an engineering view that is communicable. We don't have to go to differential or difference equations. We can simply look at the graph models, provide an engineering view for technical and even business aspects. We look at a computing centric view as a subset, including people in organizations and human interactions, the power skills, if you wish. They should be complemented by discipline specific skills and interdisciplinary skills. At the appropriate level, they should include at least some discussion of cryptography, and they need to be tailored to the institution, the resources, the students, and the jobs that they will be seeking. Next. Okay, we need to evaluate from a risk theory or stamp viewpoint, threats and examples, defenses and responses. Look at the socio-technical environments, the software, the business, the people, the end users, the threats and human threats. Look at various perspectives, including systems thinking, cybernetics, dynamics. Look at the design process, secure software engineering, and look at the privacy, confidentiality, intellectual property, and so on factors. From the technical view again, we can look at all of these factors, ranging from the mathematical, the software engineering, the architectural and tool environment, the deployment, social factors, management as aspects, access control, physical aspects. Okay. And we have to look at what guarantees we want to provide, what views that people should have, what interfaces they should have, the end users, the customers who may very well be different from the end users, the operators, the clients of the users. If I'm selling a software product or I'm maintaining a software system or I'm running for an enterprise, my enterprise will have people who are relying on it, management, development team, requirements and risk team, security team, provide appropriate information to each, but hide information that they are not entitled to or shouldn't see, 
deal with the education of the security professional. Okay. And then a long term view, sorry. Uh, look at all of these issues. OK, go on. And we need to look at the question of how long can we wait to provide security? Tension between information and privacy. Look very much, and as I said, we need to deal probably more with this at user behavior. Cost, time and effort deal with both a static focus on our needs and a dynamic focus on our challenges, trade-offs between focus on security and other risks, monitoring versus intrusion versus performance penalties, and the allocation of security responsibilities. Conclusions, goodness, In security, the computer-mediated world is not a discipline easily addressable not a problem easily addressable within the context of a single discipline. We've provided an interdisciplinary, if somewhat limited view of how we look at the technical aspects. Academia and enterprises can view uh, benefit from security specialists with a systemic view. StampSec is an organizing principle for a great deal of that view. The security curriculum can be based at least in large part on this principle. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, the it was a packed presentation, and I think it was a great segue into one of the questions we're getting in the Q and A on the Yahoo app. Uh, there are a lot of students who are watching this right now, and Jeremy, if you want to tackle this first, uh, the question seemed to revolve around um, what are what major, right? What major should I take on if I want to be able to, you know? sort of ensure a job in cybersecurity when I graduate. What are some things students who are sophomores and up can start doing now? Maybe they have two or three years to go before they jump into the field and they start applying for jobs. And uh, maybe even touching a little bit on what are the hiring managers? I know, Jeremy, you mentioned that this is something that's really within your purview. Uh, what are the hiring managers looking for uh, for recent graduates? Uh, maybe if you could touch on that. And then after this, uh, David Weiss, the founder and director of the Institute for Dispute Resolution at New Jersey City University is going to jump in and he's going to lead our panel discussion. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, and, and thank you, Dr. Marlowe and Friar Laracy as well. Um, it was an excellent presentation and um, I'd start off by echoing some of what they said in their presentation that um, security really has to be a holistic view. Um, from practical experience, I've seen systems that were taken down by a simple two dollar switch that failed to cut over to backup power supply just because it was such a minor part of the overall plan that no one thought to look at it so um you, you've got everything that that's included there you've got to look at um as far as careers and jobs um one thing i will say you know i've always looked for students that that are that i'm hiring i've looked for ones you know people that have uh, drive initiative who have gone above and beyond to try to get practical experience. Um, this could be, you know, taking a part time job while you're still in school that has some security application to it. Um, if you can find a security related internship, if you can do research work in the security field, um, even something as simple as going and getting a job for Geek Squad at Best Buy. I mean, you'd be surprised uh, how many students I've I've interviewed that had never worked a, a practical job in security. And and, you know, some of the questions we had, people are asking, you know, they're they're entry level jobs, but they're asking for two or three years of experience. And I would say it's important for students to work on building their experience while they're still students. Um, you know, even if it's just something they're doing in their spare time, playing around with the the Kali Linux, learning how to launch these tools. There are a lot of free resources out there online and you can build up your practical experience, um, you know, sort of uh, without with, you know, even if you can't find a job, you can work on building up those skills, um, the practical knowledge that you need. So, OK, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to wrap up by saying that I, I wouldn't, you know, there's so many different varied fields and and 
career paths. I wouldn't recommend a, a particular degree would be right for any one individual. Um, you know, there, there's so many different ways you can go. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Marlowe. I'd just say a couple of things in terms of what you might want to see, particularly if you're interested in the technical end. One oh, thing yeah. is you definitely want to look do something with software engineering. If you can expose yourself to agile software principles and agile development, and it doesn't have to be a formal course, but you need to learn something about that. The second thing is I think you need a little bit of data science. You definitely need to see at least an introduction to data science or data analytics because that's going to become a pre or is already one of the most pressing challenges with the cloud, the huge data sets, and it's also an important tool. The third thing I would say, and I already mentioned this to Jeremy, is I think that it's it's very useful. One of the things you can do is with your courses, whether your instructor is going to ask for this or not, start looking at survey articles in the field and trying to write up annotations of what that said and how you reacted to it, where you think it should go, what you thought was missing, what you liked, what you didn't like. You're going to be asked to do this in the real world anyway. You're going to be asked to go out and read something and explain it to other people. And it gives you the skills at interviews that are going to be very valuable. And the last thing I would say is, Jeremy talked about jobs. I think they're very important. Remember, there are also jobs on campus. Mm -hmm. There are jobs in help centers. There are jobs for different departments. You might be able to find a professor who has gotten a small grant to include some security component in his course or to deal with other issues related to security experience as a research assistant or working on campus will also count and there are more of those jobs than you think and they're not that hard to get okay i'm done okay thank you gentlemen david go ahead uh, why don't you lead the panel uh you know we have a couple minutes with the 10 50 time slot but i don't think it'll hurt if we go over and, and try and you know maybe branch it out towards the 11 o'clock if possible Uh, David, you're muted. I'm mute. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yep. Perfect. Yes. Now it's good, right? Yep. All right. Yep. So um, it was a very interesting conversation on many different levels. Uh, I'm Professor David Weiss, as mentioned. I run the Institute of Dispute Resolution at New Jersey City University, where we focus on an inter uh, interdisciplinary approach uh, that is multifaceted, that deals with asymmetric information. Um, and I'm very actively involved on the policy side for data uh, privacy, as well as for cybersecurity. So I had listened to a number of the different panelists and I have uh, maybe some questions. Maybe we start with Father Lar Laracy. Father, you, you talk about um, really the com communications and control features mm -hmm. uh, within the spatial design of system dynamics. Could you amplify a little bit further some of the hurdles besides the positives, but some of the hurdles uh, around this model? Uh, especially for what we'll call within the static sort of design? Sure, great question. Thank you. So um, given that our, our general approach is to utilize control actions to enforce uh, security requirements, these constraints, the, to, to exercise the right control action, you need to have the communication. The communication, if you're looking at it from a layered view, the lower layers, um, to, to be able to, as I pointed out, avoid the pitfalls of doing the right control action at the wrong time, uh, doing the right control action for um, uh, too, uh, too late. So um, the, the kind of 
synergy between communication and control is is very is very tight and um, the, the communication of course uh, is multifaceted it's humans talking to humans humans interacting with uh, technical systems and also computers talking to computers so all of that has to be to be factored in when you're when you're applying stamp sec and trying to develop um, either develop a new system with with cybersecurity features or uh, do a uh, kind of an overhaul of an existing system to improve some of the security properties. And that's, that's interesting, and, and, and that would be a, a great way to segue into Dr. Marlowe. Um, when you spoke about um, data science, uh, you know, we at the IDR focus a lot of our attention as well in, in behavioral intelligence. Uh, how how do you see some of these complexities uh, based on what um, Father Larcy has just mentioned that you could amplify that are these connectivities, but also these interconnectivities, especially around the uh, around the field of data analytics? Uh, you know, we could start from a, a basic concept for many of the students listening uh, that we'll call maybe in history will refer to as the watershed moment of Cambridge analytics. But if we look at behavioral intelligence through the prism of data analytics and deep learning and AI. How would you sort of um, amplify what Father um, uh, Larcy has just discussed? Well, I hope this is responsive, but I'd say let the, there's sort of three different issues, right? One, and I hope I'm responsive to you, but one is going to be the issue that the large data sets and data science are opening up vulnerabilities in the use of the cloud. And but on the other hand, behavioral analytics both allows us to identify threats. So I can look and say certain things are happening more often, certain attacks are coming from our particular types. On the other hand, it also allows, as you said with the Cambridge Analytics, it allows people to isolate characteristics of certain classes of users or possibly even individual users if they want to look for uh, people in a particular enterprise. We saw a talk from one of our students a few years ago is now developing a uh, information security program for University of Pittsburgh where he talked about looking at the characteristics of particular officers of a corporation to find out where the vulnerability was going to be. Well, so they looked at their file naming patterns, file alteration pattern, protection, how often they ran security suites and so on and figured out where the weaknesses were. I think it's a great point you make and it's, um, you know, while, while we're talking about hard data, um, there's also a humanistic element to this. Uh, in fact, within our prism of dispute resolution, we refer to what we focus on in the field of mediation. So there's a lot of cultural biases because someone is still writing that code. In fact, um, there was a uh, issue uh, relative to um, a World Bank project that dealt with um, data analytics and uh, AI. Um, actually it was the WHO, let me correct myself. And it had to do with um, helping in the, uh, you know, African countries and assisting and supporting uh, uh, major subsidies for healthcare. So this is the life science sort of uh, corridor. But one of the things they found is that those writing the code came from the prism of their own cultural bias. So when we look at human intelligence, uh in how we frame these systems what would you consider to be some of the ways that we could maybe from an intertransdisciplinary approach to our students have them take other courses that will enable them not to just look at it from a logic a to b perspective but also understand that there's a human element to the outcomes well i think one thing is going to be uh interdisciplinary, critical thinking focused courses. Another, I mean, I'm getting back to an earlier point, diversity in hiring, I think not just social diversity, but academic diversity, diversity of interests. And I think that the keynote actually mentioned neurodiversity, get people with different thought patterns, different cultural backgrounds, different 
challenges, different uh, expectations to look at programs. It gets back to something that also is a feature of agile programming, right? To make your team as diverse as possible. So when you do your weekly or daily reviews of what's been going on, somebody can, and what you plan to do in the future, somebody can say, but what about this? Or this meets that expectation. I don't know if that's completely dealing with what you like, but I, I think it's a very important issue. And then the other thing is, is you uh, maybe try to isolate the expectations of the culture. And again, AI, machine learning, pattern seeking, whatever, data mining, versus some of the patterns either in the code or expectations back off. One of the problems is if you have code and you don't have design and specification documents, you're missing something. So yeah, yeah. maybe what you need to do is to look at the mismatches between cultural expectations on the one hand and some sort of requirements or design specification for the program on the other because you're not going to find it in the code usually. It's an interesting, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there for a moment and transition to Jeremy. Jeremy. Oh, um, Dave, could I add something to sure, what they were just please. talking about? Absolutely. The, the diversity of thought and ideas is something as, as a hiring manager, I've looked for that actively. And, and you know, a lot of students may not realize it, but some of the problems that they've endured the hardships that they've overcome, those are those are great selling points to a hiring manager when you can say, look, I I overcame some great obstacle to get where I am and learn what I have. And I'd rather have people like that on my team because we're going to come up against obstacle obstacles as a team. And I need people that are used to dealing with that. I don't want someone who's never, never had a hard moment in their life. Um, they might crumble under pressure in cybersecurity. So that's all I wanted to add to that. Thanks. No, I think it's a very fair point. And um, Dr. Marlowe, maybe there was a follow-up you wanted to say that. All, all I was going to say is another thing I would look for, and it happens to be one of my own features, purely by coincidence, is I would actually prefer to work on problems with other people and I'd often prefer to work on problems that other people bring to me than try to develop something on my own and follow it. But partly because I like interacting, I like talking, I like learning. As, as I say too often, I, I have never learned from somebody who agrees completely with me. I think that's very important. And I think also as, as, as professors and even in the um, professional world, when we talk about these fancy words of cross-disciplinary approach or inter-transdisciplinary um, modeling for academic purposes, what we're really talking about is what Dr. Marlowe is very, in a very humanistic way saying. It's about collaborating together because the outcome is going to be something more maximized um, and have a better, I think, more efficient result. Jeremy, let me ask you a question um, just to flip to, again, to give some, some thought to a number of different very important commentaries uh, in the short period of time we've had from all of you speaking. And I, I learned a great deal, by the way, myself and, and the notes I took. Um, you know, we talk about um, jobs, right? And, 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 and obviously cybersecurity. I was, I was reading something uh, uh, last night uh, with just in the, the, the really the, the fintech space uh, for cybersecurity and uh, uh, banking uh, 4 million jobs opportunity in cybersecurity. It's an outrage, it's, it's, an, it's an unbelievable opportunity in what we call the new collar age of jobs versus you know, what was defined before COVID uh, uh, is now has a definition that was uh, established by the uh, current CEO of IBM. So new collar jobs. Jeremy, tell us a little bit in that respect that you can help not only our students listening, but also the professors and, and those that uh, are within higher education that we can use to really map out a new collar job trajectory that has some of the, the um, continuum of this discussion, 
both from Father Lowry as well as Dr. Marlowe, that will help not just from the scientific perspective of cybersecurity and the engineering side of cybersecurity, but also other sorts of interdisciplinary um, courses and joint degrees, perhaps, that will amplify some of that new collar job uh, experiences that you may be looking for. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, and I, I'll try to be brief. I know we're up against a time limit here. Um, I think, you know, as as everyone else has, has mentioned already, you know, having someone that's as well-rounded as, as possible is important. You know, take taking a uh, a variety of different classes, having those different experiences is all going to serve us well. Um, and uh, and that's that's really what we're looking for. Um, as far as job growth, um, you know, in some of the research I did just in the different p you know pieces recently, that some of these fields are growing at twenty or thirty percent growth rate. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of cybersecurity jobs available. And uh, there's going to be a lot of jobs that don't even exist right now that are going to be created. Um, for instance, when I was when I was you know younger, you probably as well, the job of chief information security officer did not exist. You know, nobody had heard of that in in the 70s and 80s. Um, now everyone knows what it is. There's going to be new jobs for the kids that are graduating now and in in 10, 20 years that we have not even heard of yet. So I think the the future is exciting. And I uh, I can't wait to see what they do with it. Yeah, yeah. By the way, in the, in the law field, it was the same analogous of what we called the compliance uh, department for lawyers. It was not right. really the primary reason we went to law school. So right. I'm going to give a for time management uh, a plenary question to the panel because all of you made statements uh, to it directly, and that is about policy. And so when we look at policy, both in the domestic framework as well as in the global context, just like GDPR uh, would be an example of, of policy that affects even here in the United States. But there are many other frameworks of policy, some that we're going to have to consider as new technology develops out and the integration of systems. Um, the most, I think, uh, pressing one that I would love to hear some commentary on is in the telecommunications infrastructure space because this is something that's very very concerning on many levels uh, because of what potentially some of the outcome may be uh, in terms of the hardware and software to what uh, father Larcy was pointing out uh, in part of his presentation as well so how how do we in the policy space of data protection and cybersecurity protection start to explore and examine some of these uh, important national security uh, issues that also affect our daily lives, which was brought up as well by some of the other uh, panelists. Uh, uh, I think Jeremy and Dr. Marlowe, you may have also referenced that as well. I think Jeremy has left us. So I will leave that to uh, Father Larcy and to, uh, to you, Professor Marlowe, as well. Father? Well, I, I think uh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, and it's, it's a tough one. But I, I would say in the in the security space, um, a key principle to inform policy would be to just acknowledge that that structural complexity that we, we referenced in our presentation. Uh, the fact that when you're you're forming a policy, acknowledging the um, uh, the different layers of security, acknowledging the socio-technical aspect, because if you just formulate a technical policy, or just formulate an organizational policy, or just formulate a communication policy, you're probably not going to achieve the security quality attributes that you're seeking. Um, and and so if there are tools like we hope in a modest way stamps uh, it can contribute to to um, to help e uh, engineers managers security experts to 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 really formulate those those um, those policies that acknowledge the underlying 
uh, structure and, and complexity? I think that you need to address. Maybe it's a triangle, maybe it has more sides I'm missing, but there's certainly three aspects that have to be considered. You have to consider information safety if you want to generalize. You have to consider information availability because we can be absolutely secure, as people have said, by taking all the laptops, putting them in a locked compartment, sealing it with lead and burying them on the bottom of the sea, but it won't help very much. <laughs> Uh, and then the third is user and enterprise behavior and goals. And you can't violate any of them and you have to, you're always going to have trade-offs. And I think that the looking at the three or four perspectives is going to be something that has to drive policy. I'm going to just take half a second to throw in one last odd suggestion on what classes should I take? If you can take a course in improvisational theater. I would add to that, um, take a course in mediation and negotiation. Yeah, um, because uh, the one will give you the ability to interact with people who surprise you. Absolutely. Conscious of your environment when you're speaking. Active listening. Active it listening, act, dynamic planning. Uh, modification of responses and plan just generally interaction with people and the other is going to give you the ability to listen to multiple points of view and try to figure out if there is a way between them i think that's those are dr marlow you may have uh, uh read the book getting to say yes which is part of the harvard negotiation project for what we what we teach our students uh uh, in my classes, which is interest-based bargaining versus position-based bargaining. And some of these tools, I hope for the students listening today, um, to the insight that, that all the panelists have provided is that what your interests are, which may you may appear to be very granular in perspective, has a, a very much more micro-level impact on everyday lives, which was uh, stated by Jeremy, I believe, in his presentation. And in order for you to really have um, perhaps a larger scope of understanding to why you want to be in cybersecurity, I, I, by having additional courses that are outside your comfort zone, that apply a humanistic element a better skill set for communication and active listening, improvisation, as Dr. Marlowe has spoken to, um, you know, a holistic perspective, as Father Lacey, Larcy has pointed out. These are key terms and connectors. And there's a purpose, I will at least uh, make the assumption that why the, these two uh, individuals who have dedicated their lives and careers to, to a very important area that you're also perhaps entertaining is that it is the next generation of development beyond probably our comprehension as we sit here today. And so I would encourage all of you that while you are thinking about your trajectory, of course, thinking about your, your jobs and careers, that you also think about while you're in university, gaining experience in uncharted territory through these cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary coursework that you may not have thought even applies to your subject matter expertise and you will find that they will so Gen I'll gentlemen say, it looks like we do need to cut it looks like we are actually holding up another presentation that was well, on that i was going to say i'm going to pass it to you eric uh and uh thank all the speakers for engaging in this uh moderating uh exercise as well yes thank, thank you everyone